Hi everybody, welcome to the Dog Walking and Volunteer Training Program. I am Marcia Helm. I am our Animal Behavior Manager here at Halifax Humane Society. Um, my job here is to keep everybody safe, is to keep the dog safe, is to keep you volunteers safe, is to keep our staff safe. So we're going to go over a few items here that will help you in reading dog body language and in determining if a dog is okay to go for a walk today and give you some troubleshooting guides to what to do if you find a problem or if you notice a dog is acting differently. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. So the first thing we're gonna go over is the importance of body language. Body language is how dogs let us know how they're doing and if they're okay with what we're asking them to do. So in the case of this, we need to kind of know when we walk up to a kennel, um, is the dog feeling okay? Are they approaching you? Or are they wanting to go for a walk today? That's our big question. And keep in mind, dogs can change their minds. They can be here for a while and quit enjoying walks. They can be here and not really like to walk that first couple days because they're stressed and grow into the, oh, I love to get out and get into the play yard. Um, so those are the things we need to watch for. So what I'm gonna ask is that you spend like two or three seconds every time you walk any dog and go ahead and see are they acting okay are they approaching you if it's a dog you've walked before are they reacting when you show up the same as they have done in the past um, sometimes if they're not and they're not as enthusiastic that can alert us to medical problems or maybe some behavior problems that are starting so just pay a little bit of attention and let me show you what we're looking for so here's the great thing these are our happy dogs. They tend to have really loose body movements. They tend to be pretty wiggly and soft. They tend to have their mouth open. They tend to approach you at more of an angle. Um, curved bodies, wide wags, play bows. If you look at the picture of sort of the husky looking dog up on top, um, I'm not worried he's attacking the other dog. Why? Because he has that bouncy, inefficient movement that says, hey, I'm practicing a pounce, but I am just playing. Um, that's what we like to see. We like to see all this really nice, loose energy. We see this a lot in our puppies. Um, we see this in some of our dogs that have been surrendered who are younger and more outgoing. Um, these are the dogs we love. These are dogs that adopt out pretty quickly, but these are the ones who, you know, are just easy going. They're adapting okay to being at the shelter. They're pretty chill. They're ready to go for the walk. They're ready to play with you, do things out in the yard. These are the ones we love. Okay, so these are our next level of dogs. These are showing some early signs of stress. Um, this happens when you go from living on a couch to being in a shelter and keep in mind sometimes that's the same day sometimes that's just been a couple days so these behaviors are not ones that make us not walk the dog what these behaviors say is hey can you move a little slower i'm not sure what's going on here um, so we want to make the dogs as comfortable as possible we want to make taking them out as pleasant of an activity as they can have they love this time out of the kennel it's a time to smell and sniff and play and hang out with people and get that one-on-one -on -one attention that they may not be getting anymore that they had all the time when they were home um, so this is our chance to really kind of learn about the dogs and and just kind of get a feel for their personality so we can pass that on to people who may want to adopt them but the early signs of stress start with things like the first thing you'll see usually is a closed mouth. So that nice open panting has gone away. The mouse is closed. Um, you'll see a tongue flick, which if you look at the picture on the bottom right of the little brown dog, it's just the tip of the tongue that usually flicks out, barely hits the nose, but some dogs do it just repeatedly. Um, if you see them doing a big wide lick, it probably means they just got a drink of water or they're swallowing a treat. But this little kind of specific tongue flick, and we'll see it in other pictures as well, that can just be an early sign of stress. Um, another strange one is a yawn. If we look at the dog up on the top right, I understand dogs yawn when they get up from naps and they yawn, you know, if they're thinking of, you know, at the end of a hard day. But you've got to think about the context here. Um, if you have a strange dog walking up and looking you in the face, that would seem like an odd time to get tired. Um, so the yawn can be a sign of stress. 
Um, and you'll see some dogs do it a lot. Some dogs do it just a little bit. Some dogs wait until they're not kind of close to another dog or a person. They'll turn away and yawn. Um, so we want to keep an eye on that. Um, one of the huge signs is the dog backing away. If we look at this adorable little puppy, he does not look comfortable. He does not look like he wants whoever is holding that camera to come any closer to him. He is backing away as far as he can. What you're also going to see on him is whale eye. That's that, you see the whites of his eyes? That means his forehead is pulled and he's got a lot of tension in his face and it's pulling it back so that his eyes are open. We'll also see that on the little brown dog on the bottom right. Those eyes are as open as they can get. But that whale eye, when you see the whites, it means slow down. All of these signs mean slow down. Um, usually if we're approaching an animal and they're not sure about us, first they turn their head. If that's not enough, they'll turn their body. Usually those ears are back. Um, you can see that on the puppy. You can kind of see that on the brown dog. Here's the hard part. Different breeds and different styles of how we fix them or adapt them make it very hard to watch ears. Um, ears and tails are things that on some breeds are removed, um, sometimes just by owners who like the look. Um, but if they don't have ears or they have cropped ears, if they have cropped tails, or if it's a dog born without a tail, this gives us sort of less signals. So we need to make sure we're watching the whole body of the dog. Um, if they're showing, if they're backing away and yawning and tongue flicking and their mouth is closed and they kind of turn away, that's a whole set of signs that say, hey, I'm not okay with this yet. And that might be a good time to back out of the kennel to go make sure you get a couple good treats. This is a good time to make sure you allow the dog to approach you because you're already in a very confined space in the kennel and approaching you is a really good way to say, okay, I'm ready for an interaction. If we approach them, sometimes they're not. Um, so easy way of doing that is have something that is of value to them. Usually treats are a good way to go. Um, if you ever need higher value treats than they have in the kennel, come to my office. I have some here. Um, but maybe treats are a good way to get them to approach you. Maybe today, if the dog is a little bit nervous, we spend five minutes leashing them up to go out and they spend a little less time outside. That's okay. That's valuable time making them comfortable with our leashing process. Keep in mind our Weiss walkies are a little bit different. Most dogs have never experienced them. So this is where that time that you put in can be more valuable in the kennel than it is outside. Um, so I'd ask you, think about that. What would be best for this dog? What would teach this dog that this activity is going to be good for them in the future? So that's where we want to kind of start. So as the stress increases, now we're getting to a side that we kind of have to pick a direction. We're either going to be trying to get closer or we're going to be trying to pull away. So the pushier dogs who are like, yes, we're going to go. I'm here. I'm going. Um, I love them because they tend to be fun. They tend to be full of energy, but they're going to come on with their head high, with their ears high, with their tail high. These are the ones that sometimes get excited and grab at the leash. These are the ones that pull forward. Here's the funny thing. I'm going to ask you to go slow with these guys too. Um, we need to make leashing as calm as possible because if we kind of wrestle them and get the leashes on, that's great, but that energy is going to be there when you step out of the kennel. These can be our dogs who sometimes need to go out the back of the kennel um, because sometimes these are the ones who want to lunge kennel to kennel and bark at and tell everybody else, hey, I'm going outside. Um, so we don't really want these walking through the center aisle. So if you ever are at the ability that you can walk one of our higher level dogs and it says take out the back of the kennel, here's the key. We don't just take that dog out of the back of the kennel. The first thing we do is use some treats and lure in the neighbors on either side. That way, as the dog goes out the back of the kennel, there's not immediately a dog next to them trying to bark at them. So it gives us a little more distance to be able to calmly walk out of the kennel, step a couple steps away so that you have a good handle on them. They're nice and calm, hopefully, other than pulling towards the yard when you get ready for your walk out to the play yard. So. These, we want to be sure, you know, we, we keep an extra eye on. These are ones who tend to be a little more dog reactive. Um, by the way, dog reactive doesn't necessarily mean they don't get along with dogs. It just means this extra hyped up environment is a little much for them. Um, some of these dogs go home and chill out and do fine. Some of these dogs go home and want to like run the house. It all depends on the dog, but if they're showing these signs, if they're getting that amped up, we want to move slow. So. Here's our other side. Our other side is they go 
shy and fearful. Um, they put their weight back. They crouch their body down. They tuck their tail. Their head is low. Um, this little dog up on, on, on the right, you see the whale eye. You see that head down. You see the mouth closed. He looks like he has a lot of tension in his body. That's a dog you'd want to find a way to lure you. Um, like I said, treats in that. Sometimes these are dogs who maybe they don't want to go out to the play yard. Maybe we need to walk them outside long enough that they get a chance to go potty in the, in the uh, courtyard. And then we want to take them to a cabana and visit with them there where it might not be as overwhelming. Some of the dogs when they first come in are like this because it's just loud. It's just different. They have no idea what's going on. So here's the funny part. Either of these, like I said, we're going to do the same thing we did for the slightly anxious ones. And we're just going to move slower. We're going to move at a nice slow pace. If either of these two types of dogs seems like it might be above your skill level, that's okay. You can always, I, I always give three options. You can ask for help. Maybe the staff member knows the dog. Maybe a staff member or another volunteer can take the dog out of the kennel for you and then you can take it for the walk. You can always ask if they can show you how they approach the dog and how it does and that way you might be a little more comfortable with that. And here's the third thing. You can always say, I don't feel comfortable. I don't feel like I'm the best person to walk this dog today and move on to the next dog. It's not about making you walk every single dog that you could possibly get out. Again, it's always about what's best for these dogs and who has enough skill to handle them. Now, if you see behaviors like this that are concerning, you're going to let me know. Um, and you can do that by going to the front desk, and we'll cover more of that later. But I need to know that they're being that shy. I need to know that they're being that nervous. But either way, make sure you're always comfortable with your choices on who you walk and who you don't. Here's the scariest picture I have. Please note, it is not a big barking dog showing you all of his teeth. Um, here's why. I think if you have a big barking dog who is showing you his teeth and letting you know, hey, look, I've got all these teeth. I'm really loud. I'm really scary. That's a dog that most people are going to avoid. Unless you know that dog, unless you have a high enough skill in walking them that you know this dog, you know his behavior, things like that. That is not the one I'm worried about. The one I'm worried about here is the dog who freezes. And a freeze is sort of that temporary split between I'm not sure what I need to do next. I'm very, very uncomfortable. I have shown you signs. Um, and if we look at this dog, his ears are back. We see the whites of his eyes. His pupils are huge. Um, I want you to note the commisher, which is the corners of the mouth. When dogs get more and more stressed, that starts to pull forward. When that pulls forward, that's a hint to you that I'm a little stressed. If you get frustrated or angry with someone and you have your teeth clenched and you kind of pull your lips forward like, Ugh, we do the same thing. So I want you to notice every, he has turned his body away and that, you know, he's turned his head away. Everything about this dog screams tension. This is the one I'm concerned with. Um, if you ever have a dog freeze, it's very hard for a living being to not be moving in some fashion. Um, if they freeze, that's very intentional because you have to pay a lot of attention to being perfectly still. If you're ever out with a dog and it goes totally quiet, totally still, I want you to stop. Don't go closer. Don't ask them for anything else. Give them a minute because whatever they're feeling threatened by needs to not accidentally trigger them further. Um, if they freeze, they're overwhelmed. Your best bet is to see if you can flag down another person, have a kennel worker come get them, or if they come out of the freeze and are just acting a little iffy, that's a good time to take them back to the kennel and let us know. And maybe we need to have more skilled people take them out. Maybe we need the behavior team to come and look at them and evaluate them. Um, maybe their kennel location is wrong. There's a lot of things we can do, but we have to know. And so when you see stiff, still, and straight, those are my three. If you see two of those three, because this one is definitely stiff, he's definitely still, he's not straight. Um, if you see two of those three, that's concerning. So these are the dogs you need to let us know about. These are the dogs that if you see this in the kennel, go ahead and step out of the kennel and ask the staff to go ahead and call the behavior team. Um, if we're here on site, we'll happily go over instantly if we can and check out this dog. It might be a new dog who's stressed just from the change of environment. It might be one who's been here for a mile. It might be one who's suddenly across from another dog. You just don't know. 
And so what we're going to do is send in people with more training and education to sort of weed that out and see what we have to do to make them less stressed. So this is the dog I want you to pay extra attention to. This is the dog that, even if it's a dog you're used to, if you see that stiff, still, straight freeze, I want you to back up and go ahead and put them in their kennel and let's find out what's bothering them. So safety first, go figure. The person who's here to keep everybody safe is worried about safety. First thing we did was we have recently redesigned our kennel carts. Um, the kennel carts are where we track if the dogs are getting out for walks every day. This is a great way when you come in to go ahead and take a look at this and say, oh, this one's been out, this one hasn't been out. Wow, this one's been out three times. Um, this is a good way to pick the dogs that you walk. Now, here's the thing. If you notice on the bottom right, we have walk levels one, two, three, and behavior team only. If you are okay to walk level one dogs or maybe level one and two dogs, and you come in and oh my gosh, all the dogs who are ones and twos have already been out today. Um, do you jump up to a three? No, you're not approved to walk threes. So what you can do is take back out the ones and twos. I, we don't have a dog here, I don't think, that would ever mind a second outing for the day. It's good for them mentally, it's good for them physically, it's good for them for enrichment, for getting out and sniffing the yard because other dogs have been there since they were there last. So don't feel like you failed because you came in and all the dogs are walked, you should go home. If you're here, go ahead and give those dogs extra time. And some of our dogs, you know, they just wanna come and hang out with you. They just want the attention. They just want, you know, a, a chance to get out. Um, go ahead and walk them again. That's a good thing. That's, again, doing what's best for the dogs. So we're always gonna read this kennel card before we enter the kennel. Um, this is where we have good information, like we need to go slow with them, which usually means they're shy. If they guard food and they have a food bowl of any kind in their run, we do not go in until we lure them outside with a tree, close the hatch, go ahead and remove the food bowl. Then we can proceed with letting them back in, leashing them up and going. Don't take that risk. Some dogs are protective over, over different objects. Um, if they are protective over their food, don't risk going in even with an empty bowl because sometimes it's the bowl they're guarding and not necessarily the food in it. Um, if they're a jumper, jumpers we usually take to yard three because it has a pretty sturdy fence and that's where we can best keep an eye on them. Um, if they're play area three only, play area three also is our yard that does not have tennis balls. We had a couple incidents in a row where dogs swallowed whole tennis balls. Um, if we are even kind of concerned with that, they end up having surgery and that to have to uh, remove those tennis balls. So if we have any concerns about their wanting to rip up and eat things that are inappropriate, we're gonna take them to play yard three. Same note, please don't walk out and throw tennis balls in yard three. Um, it is tennis ball free. It is a little more jump resistant than the other ones. Um, sometimes you have a dog who's a jumper. You can ask for a second leash. You can leave the Weiss walkie on, hook a second leash to it so that they have more space, but that way they're also out in the play yard, but still on leash so that they can't jump out. Um, we have had dogs who've tried to clear in one leap our, our fences. So we keep that part in mind. The last thing we want out there is a loose dog. If you see it checked for heartworm treatment, leash walk only, that means we wanna to try to do a nice calm walk. The heartworm treatment is slowly killing off the heartworms. Um, if they run off leash and play and bounce around and are crazy, that can break off clumps of heartworms and that can be very dangerous for them. So we wanna kinda of keep them calm. Now, does that mean all of our dogs are going to be calm on their walk? No. So don't get too worried if a dog that's more hyperactive and a little more energetic goes for a walk and they're pulling and they're getting excited and they're wanting to sniff everything. That's okay. The leash walk is still gonna keep them from doing the all out racing around like they do in a play yard. So, so long as it says heartworm treatment, please leash walk only. And here's another hint. If you see a dog with two strange shave spots on its lower back, that's a heartworm treatment dog. If you see a dog with those shave spots, and you don't see the heartworm treatment checked, please let our staff know. We can, we can change that instantly. Um, how do you know when they're eight weeks out for their treatment? Because we ask that they be kept calmer for eight weeks as that treatment works. Um, here's the thing, by the time the eight weeks hit, usually that hair is growing back. And so at the end of the heartworm treatment, 
you're almost not gonna be able to see the shape marks. And hopefully none of our dogs are here for eight weeks after their heartworm treatment. So we shouldn't have to worry about that, but if we do, good to know. Okay, you're gonna see guards toys. Um, guards toys is kind of like guards food. This is your warning that we do not take toys away from the dog. But here's the thing, I don't think we should ever take toys away from the dog. Even a dog who's willing to play fetch, I suggest you gather up a couple toys, throw one if it brings it back, throw a different one. If they go for that, you can then pick up the one that's there. And if you ever go to reach for a toy and a dog sort of stiffens up, again, we're gonna look at that body language. If they stiffen up, if they growl, um, that means don't take my toy. And so please don't take their toy. Um, if you have a dog who has a toy who's not gonna let it go before you take it back to their kennel, that's okay. Go ahead and take them back to their kennel because at some point in time, alert our staff and then we can look for a time when they either go outside without it or they come inside without it. We can close that hatch and retrieve that toy safely. Um, if they guard toys, that's important to know. But like I said, just out of safety because sometimes they don't show us in our assessment if they'll play with toys, if they'll guard toys or not. Like I said, I always gather up a couple and play sort of rotating fetch with them if they'll play fetch. Um, if we run out of toys, please let me know and I can go find some more. We can get some more and we can ask for donations for more. So those are all ways you can help us. And those are all ways that you know, we, we learn more about these dogs. And in the end, the more you know, the more you can tell people who are looking to adopt them. Um, one thing that's very, very important is our dogs only meet each other during a meet and greet with the behavior team. So if you're outside, we're asking you to keep 20 foot distance between one dog and another dog. Um, if someone's looking at the dog and is interested in how they do with the other dogs, hey, send them up to the adoption desk. They can set up a meet and greet. Um, we do meet and greets if people are interested in adopting two of our dogs. We do meet and greets if people are interested in bringing their dog from home to meet our dog here. It's a stressful environment, but at least that way we get some idea of if they get along, if they don't get along. Um, but we can do that and we can send our team out and we can introduce a couple different dogs. Um, but what we don't do is have people just randomly having them sniff. This does include letting them sniff through the fences and the play yards. Um, we don't let them interact just randomly. Um, sometimes we have play groups, which is fine, but that's also ran by a behavior person. So no random meeting. No, oh, we're really close. We'll just let them sniff. That's not how we do it there. Please help us keep that in mind. We always want to have someone who knows an awful lot about behavior and body language and just really advanced knowledge of dogs to be the ones who lead the play groups and who lead the meet and greets. So if someone wants to meet a dog, if they wonder how that's doing, or if you see them walking down the kennels, like letting their dog sniff all the other dogs, that's just stressful for the dogs in the kennel and the dog walking. So let them know, hey, head up to the adoption lobby. They can set up a meet and greet with any other dog you're interested in or your dog's from home. And so that helps us keep things orderly. It keeps us safer. So in the end, that's our goal. So if a dog seems anxious or overexcited, we're gonna leave even more space. So every now and then we do get dogs who are pretty reactive to other dogs, which means they bark at them, they lunge at them, they get very focused on them. We're gonna leave more than 20 feet. Um, it means if a dog is like leaving the kennel and you're standing there waiting to come into the kennel, back up, back up quite a ways and give them room to come out. Um, to me, if a dog is coming out of the kennels, that dog has priority over a dog going back in because that's a dog standing in the middle of a bunch of barking dogs. So if I'm coming up and I see another dog in there who's getting ready to exit, I back up, let them exit, and then I enter. Um, that's just a good way to keep the dog safe. The last thing you want is dogs meeting, you know, right at the doors. Um, that's already a hyped up time because they tend to get a little more anxious as they come back closer and closer to the barking dogs in the kennels. That's another way we can keep safe. So really important is this this kennel card and make sure after you walk a dog that you put your initials on the day that you walk them that's how we track it so thank you for that if you have any other questions feel free to come and contact me so in the adoption kennel the dogs are loud they're very excited when you walk through the kennel you are their best part of their day i can tell you this our kennel staff cleans and the dogs are quiet um, it's not till the first dog walks through with a leash that the dogs light up and everybody barks and everybody makes noise. Um, believe it or not, when no one's here and I do walkthroughs at night, 
all the dogs are sleeping, all the dogs are calm. So it's nice to know that they're not hyped up all the time, but they're hyped up all day once they see a volunteer with a leash. Because it means you're either coming for an enrichment, you're coming for walks, you're here to do something fun. So please don't assume that our dogs that are barking and all excited when you're there in the kennel are going to do that at home. Um, this is the best part of their day. Like I said, they're excited to see you. And it's kind of one of the reasons most people like to walk with dogs is you're excited to see the dogs and especially your favorite dogs. The dogs are excited to you. Um, again, I'm going to reiterate, if you're ever not sure or not confident that you can't get a dog out of the kennel, um, stop. Stop. Let someone else help you. Watch another volunteer or another staff member take this animal out so that you can kind of learn this is their behavior, this is what they're doing, this is how they do it. Um, like I said, if you look at those dogs on the bottom and the one on the top, they're eager. They just want your attention. So that's what you can do while you're here. So environment, a kennel environment stressful. There is noises, smells, sights, sounds, people coming and going. Um, everything here amps up dogs or scares dogs. So no matter how they act, I'm always gonna ask that you move slowly when leashing, entering, and exiting the kennel. That doesn't mean I don't want you to have your leash prepared. You're usually gonna want your Weiss walkie hooked onto a collar before you step in. It saves you a step. It lets you be a little more efficient. Um, you are gonna keep the leash short when you're walking through the middle of the building. And when I say short, I don't mean three or four feet. I mean that dog needs to be right next to you and you need to walk with a purpose. Um, please don't run, please don't power walk. That's how people slip, that's how people fall. Um, but we wanna move. We wanna make sure we're like looking at the door and moving towards the door. Um, you'll notice a lot of the dogs will sort of jump side to side, trying to bark back at the dogs that are barking them. We wanna limit that as much as possible. If you take a dog out who is jumping back and forth and barking at the other dogs, we need to make sure that you let us know maybe that's a dog who needs to be marked as goes out the back. And again, that means we lock in the two side dogs so when they go out, there's no one charging them right from the edge of the kennel. Um, we're gonna leave 20 feet or more when walking between dogs. It seems like a lot of space, but if you think about it, everyone has about six feet of leash. Your arm is a couple feet. So we're up to like 16 feet right there. Figure an excited dog can probably yank you a step or two. That 20 feet begins to seem like not so much space after all. Um, so when we say 20 feet, this is really in mind for the safety of everybody. Um, the play yards are great. Um, we've just sort of updated them. We've added one more, so we have four now. Keep in mind how many people are here. So we usually take them to the play yard for 15 or 20 minute sessions. Um, that's usually good enough that they get to run around, they get to pee on things, they get to sniff things, they get to see if we had raccoons here last night or were the feral cats in there, who else has been outside. It's exciting for them. So don't be surprised if they go out there and they want to sniff instead of playing with you. Um, after about 15, 20 minutes, please keep an eye out. There's usually other people waiting to go out to the kennels. If they're out in the yard, go ahead and rotate. Maybe then take them for a walk before you bring them in. Um, maybe sit with them on a bench and pet them. Some of our dogs really do prefer petting to going out running around like crazy. They just want the attention. That's fine too, but we have benches that are outside of the yards for just that purpose. Um, you know, we're letting them sniff. We're letting them experience the world. Keep in mind that's the happiest, most enriching part of their day. So this is great. Um, the one thing I will mention is the one person who trumps you being out playing with a dog is me. Um, so if you see me walking out with a, or Savannah out with a new dog that you haven't seen, um, it's probably someone doing a dog to dog introduction. In the end, our first goal is to get these dogs adopted and send them home. What that means is they're here for a meet and greet. What that means is we need a play yard so that we can do the introduction. And if the introduction goes well, that dog's going home. So if you see us walking out with a strange dog and a couple people, I'm gonna ask someone to leave a yard. If all the yards are full, we need a yard, we need to send the dog home. So you can help me with that by if you see my team or myself walking outside, if you can just say, hey, we'll go, go for a walk around. Usually the intros are less than a half an hour. Maybe your dog's already tired. If your dog is not tired, wait around and see if someone else leaves another play yard or walk them until we get done and then we'll give it back. Um, some of the intros take shorter time, some of them take longer, but like I said, that's a chance for a dog to go home. That's our goal of being here. Um, as nice as it is to see the same dogs and see the favorite dog, we want them to go home. So I ask for your help in freeing up a kennel for that so that we have a play yard we can intro in. 
exercise. Our dogly walks, they, they're exercise. They keep our dogs healthy. It's the only hat time they have where they can actually burn around and bust around and run and play and be goofy. Um, more importantly, it gives them one-on-one -on -one time with people. Um, which lets you learn about what is this dog like? What are they not like? Um, if you have any comments about what they seem to appreciate mm -hmm. in that, please let our adoptions list, desk know. We can add that as a memo so that we read it to potential adopters. Um, if they're great at fetch, things like that, we can add that to their kennel card. And people can read that this is a dog. Oh, I want to play fetch. This dog plays fetch. This dog likes the pool. This one, oh, we have a pool. You know, it's that's how we find the best fit for those animals. Um, it teaches them us what they like and what they don't like. Like I said, if you're out there and you notice that they don't like to give toys back, we need to know that too. We can go ahead and mark on their kennel card that they guard toys. It doesn't have to be severe guarding. It's just something that we then need to warn potential adopters about that, oh, when he has a toy, you might want to throw a second one. Um, it doesn't usually stop them from adopting. It just lets us give them all the information that we possibly have to make this dog good in their home. Um, this is their chance to smell the world. So you're going to find that our dogs, for the most part, do not heal. They're going to pull on that leash. They're going to sniff things. They're going to look around. Here's the thing. I'm going to say let them. Um, let them sniff. Let them smell. It's, you know, scent is big. Dogs need to smell new things. They need to smell. They need to look. They need to, like, feel the grass under their feet. I'm not worried about these dogs learning how to heal. Um... Some of them have never been on a leash until they got here, so they might be so new to the leash that the leash itself is a new experience. So have a sense of humor with that. Um, the ones that are really, really excited, they tend to blow out to the dog yard and be like, yes, we're going. They tend to walk nicer on the way back. Keep in mind that this is not necessarily indicative of how they're gonna walk if they're in a home and they get out every day. So things like that we wanna keep an eye on. But if you find something that they really love to do, Go ahead and let us know. Like I said, that's the stuff we want to promote. That's the stuff we want to tell, you know, their future owners so that they don't miss an important opportunity that maybe we had time to learn something that they won't in a home. So this is always good. Those outings are the best part of their day. I just can't even say that enough. So healthy dogs are happy dogs. Um, I want you to alert a manager if you see a dog that shows any of these symptoms. Um, not a kennel staff member, not a behavior specialist, not, I want you to find someone in a polo shirt that says manager on it. Because if we're having issues, some of these are important enough that we need to get them, make sure the notes are in, make sure the memo's in, make sure the process is set up correctly. Um, if the dog seems lethargic, if the dog who's usually jumping on the kennel gate to greet you is laying on his bed, if they have a runny nose or watery eyes, um, if they're suddenly losing weight. These are things that we need to know because these are probably, they might possibly be medical conditions that need to be looked at. Um, those we need to make sure we get this information and depending on how bad it is, we get this information to our vet staff and our vet staff quickly. Um, please don't grab the vet staff themselves. They have the responsibility for about 450 animals at a time here in the shelter, um, but grab us. We know how to get the information to them and if it's urgent, we can proceed from there. We get vitals, we check them, we make sure that if they're really sick and every now and then animals get sick, um, we get that to our vet team so that they can get them the most appropriate care as quickly as possible. On the behavior side, if they're getting to where they're getting a little more jumping on you, they're mouthing, so they're kind of grabbing at the leash, they're grabbing at your arm, things like that becoming harder to handle on the leash, um, beginning to nip at you when you're walking them or leashing them, those are behavior things. I need to know about those. So if you go to a manager and tell them, Marsha's not here, because if Marsha's here, please just ask for me. Um, but go to a manager and tell them, Marsha needs to know this. They can send me an email. Um, if it's something really concerning, they can call me. They have my number. They can call me any day, any time. Um, but those behavior problems that are starting to amp up, we might need to catch, we might need to change some processes with these dogs so that they don't continue and get worse. Um, by the time dogs are really snapping at leashes and things, now we have a harder time dealing with them. Now we could have stepped in maybe a few steps before they got to that crazy point. And maybe we need to set up a specific leashing plan. Maybe we need to have less people interacting with them. Maybe we need fewer people because they're just getting overwhelmed. Um, maybe it's a cute dog who's gone out 15 times a day and they're just done. Um, so I can adjust things for that. That's my job. I'm here to keep, like I said, everybody safe. So 
If it's medical behavior, if the dog just isn't acting right one way or another, let us know because you're going to see them probably more frequently almost than the staff is hands-on with them. You're going to know their personalities a little bit better. If you have a concern, please bring it up, but please bring it up to a manager. Um, that just helps us do our job and keep the dogs like as happy guests of our hotel. Um, that's our goal is how do we make them the most comfortable, the most safe, the most stress-free that we can. So what about stubborn dogs? You know, we have dogs who just don't want to do things, who just whatever. I want you to think about this. Um, dogs don't tend to be stubborn for no reason. Um, people do that because we have choices. But here in a shelter, I want you to keep in mind, these dogs may be scared of the sight, sound, smells of the shelter. If you've lived in a home and then you walk into that kennel and had to stay there all day, all night, every day, it's overwhelming. Um, if they don't want to go back to their kennels, it's because they get out of the kennel, it's nice and quiet, you get attention, you get treats, you get play, and then you go back. Um, I would be slow to return to my kennel as well. Some of them really do come in where they have never been on a leash. Um, and so to have people take them out on a leash every day is terrifying. It's a new experience in a very loud, kind of hectic place. Um, so some of the hesitation in that that you see not necessarily stubborn, it can very much be a lack of experience. Um, not knowing how to behave around other dogs, or they're sometimes scared of other dogs. Um, we do get dogs who have been either only dogs or they've been a dog out in the yard where they've not been exposed to much. We get a lot of those. Um, they just don't know what to do, they don't know what to think, and those dogs tend to get a little overwhelmed. Those tend to show those crouching, more fearful behaviors the best thing we can do for them is be confident, be calm, move nice and slowly and predictably, and teach them that it's okay, it's safe here. Um, some of our dogs are on the other side of that. They have excess energy and they want to run and jump and play. You know, they're not doing that to annoy you, they're doing that because they're excited that you're there. Um, and some people get frustrated with that. If you get frustrated with that, maybe don't walk the dogs who are quite the most exuberant ones that we have maybe go down a level if there's anyone like i said that you're not really comfortable with or that just kind of eh, isn't a good fit it's okay you don't have to walk that dog someone else will come in and make sure that dog gets walked um we always want you to feel happy for being here and make sure that you feel you know good with what you're doing um you are just as important as the dogs because we're trying to make everybody benefit from this and if for some reason you're not please let us know if there's something we can change if there's something we can work on we need to hear that and we can either let you know why we don't do that or it might be a new idea that we haven't had that we'd like to enact so share share all all your thoughts all your input um, we're happy to hear it and so we ask that you're understanding with the dogs who seem stubborn it's they display behavior for a reason um, it's not just random and you know a lot of these dogs we don't know their backgrounds we don't know what they came from we don't know why they do things but no matter how they got here we're always going to be conscientious with them and take care of them while they're here so we want to make them comfortable if for some reason we're not seeming like we're doing that let me know and we'll add things we'll adjust things as we need um, our job is to make them you know comfortable here so that they're nice when people meet them and then they can go home. So the shorter time they have here, the better, um, which I know makes it hard because then you have new dogs every week when you walk them. But our job is to make them comfortable and make them confident because, you know, that's what people look for in dogs. So anything you think of that could help with that, anything that you think that we could help with that, let us know. So what about the dogs who won't go in or out of the run? Um, first, always, again, Decide if you're comfortable working with this dog. If you are, please follow these tips and see if that helps. Um, if you're not, that's okay too. You can always watch someone else take them in and out. Um, usually if you watch a couple times, you kind of catch on to some tricks that the people who are currently walking them do. Um, and you can follow that lead and they'll get comfortable with you too. So I say sometimes we lure the dog with treats. I suggest carrying a couple treats at all times. Why? Because dogs are usually food motivated. So I, I, I say the only time we should be in a run with a dog is if we're leashing it up to take it for a walk. So, you know, I'll enter or exit the run while calling the dog. So, hey, I'm here, what are you doing? And so that usually gets them to come for you. Um, but I'll also make sure that when I'm stepping out into the hallway, 
if they're not pulling to come out, if they're a little worried, I'll step out first. That way they know, hey, it's safe for me. Um, sometimes you step out, you offer them a treat, sometimes they'll come out. If you're entering the run and they don't wanna go into their run, I'll step in first and drop a couple treats and that can lure them in just because that's a nicer like, oh, it's safe for you, maybe it's okay for me. Um, if you're having more problems than that, please let me know. Like I said, sometimes we need special behavior things. Sometimes we need to move the kennel to a quieter part of the, of the, of the adoption kennel. Sometimes we need to do something different to make them comfortable. Um, I've been doing this for about 35 years, so I usually have quite a few ideas if you just let me know. Um, if all else fails, ask for help from a kennel okay. staff member or another volunteer who's been walking that dog. Um, we do have dogs who learn to go out and don't want to come back. We do have dogs who are reinforced for that. So finding out what other people are doing to manage that can be a pretty useful thing. So please rely on each other, rely on our staff members. Um, everybody has a different kind of perspective with dogs. So maybe someone has a perfect way to do it and maybe other people can learn from that as well. So sometimes you'll notice some interesting behavior and be like, hmm, do I need to let someone know? And the answer is usually yes. You need to let a manager know immediately. This is things like growling when they have a toy. Like I said, that can be toy guarding. That can be something that we need to put a note on their kennel that says we always trade toys when we're playing fetch. Um, it's something that we also need to let future adopters know. They may or may not show that behavior in a home, but it's always nice to have a little warning so that they know to pay attention. Um, nipping when leashing and unleashing. If they're sort of grabbing at you, that's something I need to know because sometimes nipping gets a little more excited and they start biting a little harder. I like to find ways of solving that before it gets any worse. So if they're starting to nip at you, I need to know. If they're sort of jumping up and grabbing at your clothes and pulling on your clothes while you're walking, um, we need to find another answer. Because again, that's behavior that they're grabbing at your clothes, you're still walking them, that sort of reinforces them to keep doing it or to do it more. Um, so we wanna stop that when it starts. Um, the ones who don't wanna walk outside, maybe we need to know what's their background. Have they ever been on leash? Have they ever, things like that. We need to set them up differently so that they can be successful with going for walks. Um, if they refuse to go through doorways, we had a dog who came in who would come out of the kennel lovely, would hit a doorway, and I mean any doorway to the outside, to the inside, and just freeze. There was something about thresholds that this dog couldn't do. Um, I spent about an hour and a half one day with a jar of peanut butter making little lumps on the floor, and we skittered through the first time, and we went a little easier the next time, and by the time we were done, the dog would walk through doorways. I don't know what made it afraid of doorways, it doesn't matter but we can solve that with a little bit of patience and a little bit of setup time because during that time, no one else can walk through that doorway. Um, if they're grabbing treats too eagerly and you're like, ooh, that was my finger, um, those I need to know, I can A, show you a different way of handing out treats that sort of saves the fingers. B, we need to know that the dog is doing it so that I alert our staff to make sure that everyone who gives treats either tosses them into a kennel, but people don't stick their fingers right in the kennel because if they're taking it too eager from you, they're taking it too eager for anyone. So let a manager know if you're having these issues. They will email me, they will call me if need be, and we'll come up with a Okay, so our accident protocol. It's a shelter, we have people, we have animals, we have a lot going on. Sometimes accidents happen. Um, if an accident happens, you need to report it to the manager on duty immediately. Um, we need you to be honest and give us as many details as possible. For general safety issues, um, we, evaluate our procedures and ensure we're doing the correct thing to fix the problem so that other volunteers, guests, and staff don't, don't get injured. Um, this can be anything from wet floors that you slip on to, oh, there's a wire sticking out in that dog yard that I brushed up against. It doesn't have to be bad. It's just, if it's something that we can look at and fix, we'd like to do that because if you can get caught on it or cut on it or it slams your finger or it does something, there's a really good chance other people are gonna experience the same. So like I said, we wanna make it as safe as possible for every animal, human, and that here. Um, cat, it, everybody. So if you see a problem or notice a problem, let us know. And like I said, that's gonna go straight to a manager. Um, we're working with dogs. So on occasion, dogs nip people. Um, for any kind of dog bite that breaks the skin, we're gonna place the dog under a bite quarantine for 10 days, which means the dog is gonna come off the adoption floor. It's gonna go over to stray for 10 days. Um, that's state of Florida law, that's what we do. Um, 
While they're over there, I'm just going to answer these because they come up a lot. No, you can't go visit them. No, you can't stand there and feed them treats. They're on stray kennel to keep them safe and protected. So we're going to hold them over there for that 10 days without interaction from anybody other than staff. So you, I, I know you miss the dogs, things like that, but that's, that's policy on that. Um, after that 10 days, just so you know, our first action is not we put the dog down. Um, what we do is after the 10 days, we reevaluate their behavior. Um, we see, and in the meantime, I've gotten detailed accident stuff from you. Um, I can go over your scenario. If someone else saw the scenario, was it something we can correct? Is it something we can avoid? Was it a dog who was going down the hallway who was getting all amped up by the other dogs who maybe needs to go out? Is it a dog who needs to be on the very end kennel so they're not getting as stressed passing other dogs? You know, what happened, how, and is there a way to prevent this in the future? Um, so we go through all that, we evaluate, we put a lot of detail and time and effort into that. Um, so please don't think that if they nip you, we give up. Um, I bring this up because this can be an issue. If a dog is jumping at a leash, things like that, maybe they nick your hand. And you're like, oh, not a big deal. I don't want to get the dog in trouble. And so if you don't tell us, maybe someone else has taken them out on leash later and they jump up and nip them a little harder. Um, they don't tell us because they don't want to get the dog in trouble. But that's a little harder of a bite. Um, maybe the third person this dog jumps up and nips is a family with kids who are out in the play yard. Um, what that means is I missed two opportunities to step in and maybe set up a different plan, a different protocol, different setting for that dog. And maybe a child got bit this time. And whether it's bad or not, doesn't matter. But the fact that it had practiced biting twice that I didn't have a chance to address can actually do more harm to that animal than letting us know when they nip and it's minor. Um, that's where I ask for a deep breath and some honesty um, because like I said, I can step in and change things. We can make some adjustments, we can, but we need to let people know who are adopting them and we need to let people know, you know, that are looking at them. It lets us know that, you know, this dog gets, you know, hyped up or this dog gets scared and if you push him, this happens. There are ways we can adjust their environment, but there aren't ways I can go back and my least favorite phrase is, oh, he's been doing that for a couple weeks now. Oh yeah, he got hurt the other day. I, that's what I hate to hear. Um, so please use your judgment. If they nip you in a break skin, I need to know. Um, that does not hurt the dog. It gives us more insight into the fact that maybe they're overwhelmed and we need to change something. And if we can change something that is much more beneficial than letting it continue and possibly letting it escalate. So with that in mind, like I said, our first action is not to put the dogs down. That's everybody's worry. That's not what we do. We're very, like I said, our, our whole goal here is to make these dogs as comfortable as possible. They're guests at our institution and we want to see them succeed. So best way I can do that is to know everything possible that we do and that they do and that they need help with. So I ask for your, your attention to that. Um, and just keep in mind, like I said, it's, it's something that we need to know. And so that needs to go to a manager immediately. So what's the next step? You've now gone through most of this training. How do you go, you know, how do you go on from here? You're going to set yourself up with a mentor and we will get you that information. They're going to teach you things that I can't. They're going to teach you how to safely get in and out of the kennels because our locks are kind of weird and we're going to make sure you don't ever get locked in a kennel. They're going to teach you where to walk the dogs. They're going to show you how to check kennel cards because I know we covered it, but it's much different in person. They're going to show you where to initial once you've walked a dog and ways of remembering that. Um, they're going to give you options of what to do in the play yard. Um, this is when it gets fun. This is when you get hands on with the mentors and get to walk the dog. I am going to take just a second and tell you about our Weiss walkie, which is our leashing system, because it's new to me when I got here and I've been doing this for 30 years, so it might very likely be new to you. So with a Weiss walkie, we do have the dogs wearing a flat buckle collar. Um, the collar needs to be fitted so that it's the correct size for the dog. But what we do is clip the leash to the collar, and then we put the end, we hold the top, put the end of the leash right behind the dog's front legs. We pull it back up and there's a ring on the end 
of the clip and you're gonna run that up through the clip. Don't worry, don't worry. We are gonna show you how to do this. Um, it takes a little practice getting used to. Once you get used to it, you'll love it just because it's a quick adjustable way that we can fit any size of dog without having to stop and get like different harnesses, different collars. Um, it makes it very nice. It makes it pretty quick and efficient to walk our dogs. Um, the big thing is you wanna make sure that the leash is around the chest, right behind the front leg. So if you're walking a dog and you see it slide back more under the abdomen, you're gonna wanna stop for a second, pull it back up. Where it, when it squeezes on the ribs, it's not that uncomfortable, but if it gets around the soft parts of the abdomen, then it begins to cause pain, then the dogs begin to panic. So we wanna make sure that stays right behind those front legs. So again, just some more pictures. It clips to the collar on the top, it goes down and around and up through that ring. It's lovely, it's a fairly easy way of leashing them. The dogs tend to pull a little less with this than they would on just a collar, and one of our goals here is not to hurt their necks, so you'll get to where you love these. Um, just remember, these are the only things we walk with dogs with here, unless you see like a harness on a kennel and it says harness only. Um, dogs, Some dogs need something different. You are not allowed to bring in your own gear for our dogs, so you must walk them with Weiss Walkies while they're here. So if you have any questions, you can always email me. I am behavior at halifaxhumanesociety.org. You can always call me. My number is 386-274-4703, extension 326. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions, whether they pertain to dog walking, whether they pertain to dog behavior, whether you have a dog at home who's doing something weird. Um, we're always here to help. We're here to help with anything. Um, my goal in life is to keep these dogs happy and keep them walked and keep them entertained and make sure you enjoy your stay here when you're here working with the animals. Um, our goal is to make everybody happy and safe. So anything you think of that you want to ask, you can ask me, you can ask Zoe, you can ask almost any of the managers. If we don't know the answer, we'll get you to the right person who has all the answers. And thank you for your time being here for our dogs. Um, really their time spent with you is the best time that they have. And so I can't thank you enough for your time and effort. And thank you for watching this presentation. Have a good day.